both genders and persons of all classes, races, religions, and sexual preferences participate in the experience of evil, and all are responsible for its perpetuation. Robert L. Moore, in his book, Facing the Dragon. Do you believe evil exists? Do you think you would always recognize evil when it presents itself? What does it take to confront and tackle evil once it has been revealed? Are some people inherently evil? Or is evil an entity that works through people, preying on the weak, damaged, isolated and corrupted in our society? And what should be the punishment for unspeakable acts of evil? These are just some of the questions that come to mind when contemplating evil. These are questions men have had since the beginning of time, since first encountering evil. It's a notion that goes right back to the Garden of Eden, when Eve was unable to resist the temptation of the snake to eat the forbidden fruit. In the following video, Dr. Robert Moore discusses his belief in a powerful, destructive force of hatred within humans, which he terms radical evil. He retells a Peruvian folktale, The Snake's Lover, to illustrate themes of narcissism and human evil, highlighting the necessity of community intervention to confront and eradicate this dark force amongst us. It is part of the Jungian genius that we are not willing to turn aside from the resources of myth in coming to terms with the truth. I'd like to suggest to you that, as von Franz has pointed out, that there are many folk tales which give great insight into radical evil. The one that I want to talk with you briefly about tonight is one that many of you may not know. It is one that I lectured on recently in the Oak Park series. It's a Peruvian tale entitled The Snake's Lover. And this tale, better than any that I've seen recently, captures something about the essence of narcissism and human evil. Let me just briefly summarize this tale and some of the points about understanding radical evil which it, among other folk tales, illumines. A young girl is doing her job as a keeper of the flock, and she is alone in the hills and meets a stranger that is very charming. She falls in love with him, becomes his lover, and soon wants to take him home with her. Fearing her parents and the community's response, she smuggles him in to the household. And he tells her to scrape out a little hole that exists in the foundation of the house so that, she, so that he can have a place. And so dutifully she scrapes out this hole in the foundation and makes him a place. And by night, they are together, and she experiences him as a great love, when in fact he is sucking her blood. The hole in the foundation gets larger and larger, and the bloating of the snake increases. And soon the family and the neighborhood begin to realize that something is amiss. The girl seems not to be well. And they go and they consult the sorcerer. 
And the sorcerer tells them that they must look very, very carefully in the home because a presence is there that is not human. And so they do this. And indeed they realize that they must have a large amount of help to confront this alien thing. And so they gather all the men of the community and they take their machetes and understanding as they do out of their tradition the nature of this alien, they understand that the girl will not want anything to happen to the alien even though it is drinking her blood and will kill her eventually. And so they have her go away on a brief trip and then the community comes into the house, uncovers the snake, and all of the men of the community together challenge this being and with great difficulty kill it. With great difficulty kill it. The young woman aborts a pregnancy and many, many little snakes are also killed by the community. And soon the girl is well again and marries and as the tale would have us believe lives a happy and fulfilled life. This is a mythic motif that von Franz has picked up and that many myths treat. And let me just highlight a number of the points that are made in this and many other mythic representations of radical evil. First of all, let me talk about possession. Then let me talk about exorcism or liberation. And elements that you may find in each. First, possession. Radical evil always disguises itself. It never presents itself as radical evil. One of the things that the scholars of the Holocaust point out is that there never was a time when the final solution was presented in all of its starkness and horror. It always was presented as something else, less distasteful to the bureaucrats. A mark of the presence of radical evil in personality or society, according to these mythic apprehensions of it, is that when it is present, people lose their powers of discernment. They get to where they cannot recognize dangerous things when they are present. Jung talked about this as the lowering of the surface of consciousness when an autonomous complex begins to possess the individual. It actually has a perceptual distortion so that the individual, for example, the person who is abusing a, a substance of alcohol or a drug, the individual cannot see the loss of will in the face of the substance. I would like to say, based on some of my studies, that one of the things that happens is that the archetype of the warrior is rendered useless because one either cannot access that archetype in the psyche in terms of being able to mobilize energy, fire, light to address the enemy, or the power of that archetype is directed toward an enemy that is not the most dangerous enemy. But in any case, the 
archetype of the warrior is rendered ineffectual. It's the kind of thing that you see in cancer and in AIDS and in other similar diseases when the body cannot recognize the enemy. The body loses its capacity to, to see what is enemy and what is not. It always catches you when you are alone or vulnerable. And of course today we would talk about narcissistic vulnerability. That is to say archetypal evil or radical evil will catch you and be able to gain strength in a personality precisely when that individual is carrying the most wounds. And so it may not be a particular wound or a particular experience that is the organizer of the destructiveness, but it is that which unlatches the door, makes it easy for this kind of destructiveness to come in. You think of what happens when child sexual abuse starts in a family. And then you think of all of the snowballing effects of destructiveness that begin to move in that family and then for generations thereafter. It always comes inside the house and the mythic apprehensions of evil always make it very clear. This point is, is, is presented time and again in, in the myths of evil. That is to say that before you're aware of it, it is already in the house. Before you're aware of it, it's already in the camp. You can't set up your perimeter at the edge of the camp because by the time you know that the thing has arrived, it's already infected someone in the camp. It always erodes the foundations. Now that's a fascinating image. Foundations of what? The foundations of order and social living. And it always does it in a such a way that it operates a lot like termites. That is to say, you don't know that the foundations have been eroded until some crisis occurs when you need them to be strong. And then you can tell that something has happened to them. It multiplies itself on your energy. A lot of little snakes are being made. That theme comes up time and again in literature from Rosemary's Baby. And you just think of all the other films and all the other books and all the other tales that pick up that theme. It always uses your creativity to multiply itself, your lifeblood. But most of all, and powerfully represented in this tale of the snake's lover is that it takes your love, it captures your love, and it turns your love into a force for death. In other words, necrophilia. After studying this material for quite some time, I have realized that the early Freudian interest and necrophilia was extremely important and that we have lost a sense for the importance of understanding that love of death and that we must get back at some sense for trying to address what it was that, that Freud was seeing when he was looking at that and the early Freudians. But radical evil turns your love, your very eros, your very lust for life into a force that will destroy you if someone does not come to your aid. And what about the marks of exorcism or liberation, which we see in this tale and many of these other sources? Well, first it requires an appeal to the community to other people. You cannot get out of this by yourself. That is, once this kind of virulent evil enters one's life, one needs a community. 
with its ritual process to help one cope with it. Does that mean individual psychotherapy is not enough? Absolutely right. Period. But the second mark, the magus or the sorcerer must be consulted. That is, human communities have always had individuals who understood about trans-egoic or transpersonal evil, who had what the specialists in spiritual direction talk about as some skills in discernment. And after that consultation, one is enabled to, and this is the third point, one is enabled to accept that there is an extra human in any kind of ordinary sense of the word human, a transhuman, a an alien, what you and I would today talk about as an archetypal ground to the problem. But it's not enough merely to acknowledge that the alien must be exposed because it always hides from the light. In all of these mythic presentations, it always hides from the light. And the erosion of the foundations which it has brought with it must be exposed as well. And in order that this be done, powers beyond the individual and the family must be brought to bear on that toxin. And finally, the victim will always resist a remedy until the work of the community in liberate, in liberation has been fulfilled and the enchantment or the spell has been lifted. Now that, and there are other things, but those are the main things that you can see when you look at these mythical sources. Robert Moore offers several tips to help you understand and confront radical evil particularly through the lens of Jungian psychology. Here are the key tips. Reflect on contemporary cinema. Spend time thinking about contemporary films that explore themes of radical evil, such as The Forbidden Planet, The Andromeda Strain, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Aliens, and The Exorcist. Value community and rituals. Recognize the importance of community support and ritual processes in confronting and liberating oneself from radical evil. This cannot be done alone and requires collective effort. Cultivate spirituality. Understand that dealing with radical evil requires a connection to a transegoic center, which involves cultivating spirituality, human maturity and coping with destructiveness, Necessitate spiritual awareness and practices. Learn from Jungian thought. Appreciate the unique contributions of Jungian psychology in understanding human evil and the shadow. Recognize the distinction between personal shadow and archetypal shadow and the need for an archetypal approach to confront radical evil effectively. With these recommendations, you can deepen your understanding and enhance your ability to confront the pervasive nature of radical evil, both individually and collectively. This is something we all need to do, as the doors keeping dark forces at bay seem to be opening wider and wider each day. For the Empowerment community, if you haven't already, I highly recommend you check out Warrior, Magician, Lover, King by Rod Boothroyd. What sets this book apart are the practical tips and exercises that Rod provides. 
These tools are designed to help you reconnect with your inner self, embrace your passions, and ultimately become the man you were always meant to be. So, if you're on a journey of self-discovery and empowerment, click the link in the description to grab your copy today. Also, check out our empowerment community on Patreon. Thanks for watching.